very excited. I'm about to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, before I do, I want to tell you a little bit about him. So he used to be a journalist. I've got to get this right for News Limited. Um, and then he led one of Australia's leading churches, which literally has, I, I just have respected uh, what you started and what you've done in that space. It's absolutely amazing. And now he regularly has gone back to jur journalism and regularly writes for The Spectator, as well as being a consultant for Alpha Crucis, overseeing marketing, recruiting, and all of their campuses. So I feel like I thought I had a full life, and now I don't. Um, but it's really, really exciting. But something I really respect Pastor James, both as a, a biblical voice, but also a cultural voice um, in our society. And uh, every time I've heard Pastor James speak, I felt encouraged, but also challenged. And so I'm believing this morning that you will feel likewise, challenged, but also encouraged. And I want to tell you that there's some resources that I want to link you to, because I'm passionate about the fact that we want to resource believers to live in this very crazy culture that we're in. Can everyone agree that's a crazy culture? very crazy. And so we want to resource you a little bit. And so before Pastor James tells you, I want to tell you that he has released a book. It's called Notes from Woketopia. And so that is a, a massive, uh, I suppose, spearhead of biblical truth in today's culture and a very straightforward and excellent voice that you want to get a hold of that today. You can get that in the four of $30 after the service. Don't, it looks thick and Jason goes, don't worry. It's a readable size. So it's very good. But I also want to encourage you is Pastor James writes regularly again for The Spectator, but you can also receive something in your email every day. And I'm telling this because then as you're listening, you're thinking, yes, I want to, I want to, I want to get that. I want to get that. And so if you go to James McPherson, which might come up on the screen, dot substack, it will actually take you to a link where you can actually uh, subscribe to a link and every day you'll get something in your email, which then will again link biblical truth with cultural happenings and actually be a sharp Christian voice in the world. And so this man I highly respect. Ooh, very good. BJ, you legend. But church, can I get you to stand to your feet? Because I would love a great encounter, generous welcome to none other than very excellent Pastor James McPherson. It's all yours. Awesome. Hey, uh, while you're on their feet, give the music team a really big round of applause. You guys did great this morning. Well done. I have never been to a church where everyone on the music team is bilingual. <laughs> or they all sing in tongues. I wasn't sure this morning, but it was great this morning. You guys did really well. Thank you. You can all, oh, you're leaving already. I didn't dismiss you yet. And you dismissed me. You can take your seats. Hey, thanks so much for having me at your church. Great to be with you. Thanks to Pastor Chris and Christine. Pastor Chris is unwell today. I was so glad to hear that. Because I would have been nervous preaching in front of your pastor, but he's not here. So now I'm totally relaxed and I can be totally naughty. Except for Pastor Christine's here. And you're going to tell him everything that I say, aren't you? Yeah, all right, I'll behave. And uh, great to be with Pastor Lorene and Pastor Paul as well, who are legends in our nation and love dearly everywhere and greatly respected so great to uh, have you here as well and how many of you know pastor paul makes you feel nervous <laughs> oh, not in a bad way just because you you just want him to like you don't you and he doesn't like that many people <laughs> so no no greatly greatly love them um thanks so much for having me in church if it's your first time here mine too so uh, I'm glad to have a few friends, and uh, if you're here regularly, uh, what a great church to be part of. Uh, I reckon if I lived in Victoria, I would come to this church, <laughs> just to get out of Victoria. <laughs> wow, everyone hates Victoria. <laughs> Even Victorians hate Victoria. We, we should, I, I just feel very relaxed this morning. I, I don't know about you, but... Do you ever watch the news and think, is it me or has the whole world gone insane? Do you ever feel like that when you, when you look at the news? I, I constantly look at the news and I think, honestly, is there something wrong with me? Or has the whole world just gone completely mental? And, you know, uh, Romans chapter 1 says that there will come a day, and I believe we're living in that day, where the world will deny the Creator and say, you know, we, we, we don't need God at all. And, and Romans chapter 1 describes a moral breakdown in society. 
where people having rejected God start to indulge all sorts of things and, and the Bible lists all sorts of behaviors that people start to indulge in and, and the world just goes mad when people reject God and God's blueprint for humanity. And so we're certainly living in that day. You know, we've uh, taken one of the, the deadly sins, pride, and we've devoted a whole month to celebrating it. And, uh, and, and so the world's just gone morally uh, crazy. Would you agree? And, and yet, in Romans chapter 1, it describes something even more problematic than a moral breakdown, and it's a mental breakdown. The Bible says that when people deny God, not only do they indulge all sorts of uh, vice, but it says that their hearts are darkened, their minds become futile, and professing to be wise, they actually become fools. And we are certainly living in that day. I don't know about you, but recently I watched on the news as our former chief health medical officer, Brendan Murphy, was asked in a Senate committee hearing to define what is a woman. And he said, I'll need to get advice from my department. <laughs> now, I'm glad you laughed because I thought it was hilarious. Here's a grown adult man, the former chief health officer, and when asked what is a woman, and presumably he's got a wife, and presumably he knows he's not one, but he couldn't say for sure what a woman was until he consulted with his department. How many of you know one of the great consolations of having to live through this period of life is it's just hilarious. Life is very funny right now. And uh, I started writing for The Spectator magazine. It's the oldest political magazine in the world. I began in uh, London, now have offices in New York and in Sydney. In fact, um, the, the, the Spectator magazine is so old that um, the first ever mention of Napoleon Bonaparte in literature was in The Spectator magazine. I forget what year it was, but way back when, someone wrote in The Spectator magazine, there's a soldier in the French military. You need to keep your eye on him. He's going places. Napoleon Bonaparte, remember that name. And of course, uh, he never amounted to much, but, um, <laughs> but, but there you go. So, so I started writing. The Spectator is, is not a Christian publication. It's a secular publication. But, but I asked if I could write to them, and they said, well, the, the problem with Christians is you're so boring, and, and you're so scared of offending anyone, but you, you, you spend all your time equivocating, saying, look, we're not saying this, and we're not saying that, and we're, we, we don't want to offend you, and we don't want to upset you. And by the time you get to what you're actually saying, we've all tuned out. But they liked me, because I'm sarcastic. <laughs> now, I know, I know, you don't believe that sarcasm is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Maybe it's not, <laughs> but I'd like to think it could be. Because I, I read the Bible, the Bible is pretty funny. You know, one of the problems with, with Christians is the only thing we agree on about Jesus is that he was nice. I'm not so sure Jesus was nice. I think Jesus is good. I'm not so sure he's nice. When you read the Bible, I mean, do you remember Elijah and, and, and there's that, that bet with the prophets of Baal and, and, and Elijah says, well, you go first. You, you see if your God can provide fire to light the sacrifice. And then when you're done, then I'll, I'll pray to my God. And whichever God answers by fire, that is the true God. And so the prophets of Baal, they're jumping up and down. They're chanting. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all sorts. And, and hours pass. And, and Elijah is sitting there and he's mocking them. He actually says, and I, I can't give it to you in the original language because we're in church, but, but he actually says, where's your God? Is he on the toilet? And I'm thinking, you can't say that. That's not very Christian. And Elijah's just, he thinks it's hilarious because sin is funny. Let me prove it to you. Psalm chapter 2 says the nations rage against God and God sits in the heavens and he laughs. In fact, the, the Hebrew word is God sits in the heavens and he ridicules and he mocks. Now, sin is tragic because it destroys lives, right? But, but there is a funny dimension to it. Let, let me explain. What, what makes something funny? If a, if a drunken homeless bum slips on a banana peel and falls flat in his face in the mud, that's not funny. Because it's in the nature of drunken homeless bums to fall over. But if, a, if an uppity, posh, uh, sort of self-righteous politician in top hat and tails, sneering at everybody else and looking down on them. If he trips on a banana peel and falls flat on his face, that's hilarious. Because <laughs> he's not meant to fall on his face. This is why sin is kind of funny, because we're created in the image of God. 
We're created to rule and reign with Christ, and yet we behave like the beasts of the field. That's kind of funny. And so I started writing for The Spectator, a non-Christian publication, from a Christian point of view, but without saying I was a Christian. You've just got to guess. But making fun of popular culture, because one of the things I find with the church, and particularly our young adults, is the world will make you think like you're the one who's gone mad. The world will make you feel like you're the bigot, you're the narrow-minded person, you're the one who doesn't understand, you're the dinosaur, you're the one who's out of place. Where in actual fact, no, no, because we believe the truth of God, we're the sane ones. Everything else has gone mental. And one of the things I think is a tragedy right now is that many Christians feel a lack of confidence and we feel like we're on the back foot and we feel like we've got to apologize all the time. Where in actual fact, the truth of God is the truth. And we ought to be bold in asserting it. You know, uh, tolerance and the use of that word has created a lot of confusion. Because Jesus was tolerant, but Jesus was also intolerant all at the same time. And we've got to be tolerant, but we've also got to be intolerant. Let me tell you how it works. Tolerance is for people. We should always be tolerant of people. Because people are made in the image of God. But tolerance for people should never be for bad ideas. How many of you know if engineers were tolerant of bad math, bridges would collapse? If doctors were tolerant of unhygienic conditions, more people would die in hospital than recover. If police were tolerant of people running red lights, the roads would be chaos. How many of you know I'm glad engineers are intolerant, police are intolerant, doctors are intolerant? Now, if it's right for an engineer to be intolerant of bad math, shouldn't it be right for Christians to be intolerant of bad ideas and bad theology? So tolerance is for people, but never for bad ideas. Intolerance is for bad ideas, never for people. So we should be meek with the erring, but violent with the error. And so I started writing for The Spectator and just trying to expose the lunacy of popular culture because it, it's, it's, it's so crazy, it's actually hilarious when you think about it. I had a famous comedian, I won't mention his name, But he he made contact with me and he said, we need to become friends. You're my favorite writer. And so we met up for coffee. And uh, he's a television personality. And we started talking. He says, I hate your writing. I I said, I thought you said I was your favorite writer. He said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I thought he must have Googled me. He said, no, I haven't Googled you. You're a journalist, right? So he didn't know anything about me leading a church. Or I said, yeah, I'm a a Christian. I said, how do you know? He said, you can just tell. Yeah, I can tell where you're coming from. I said, well, why, do you, why am I your favorite writer, but you hate me? He says, because I read your stuff in The Spectator, and I laugh. And he said, I'm a professional comedian, so I understand how something's only funny because there's a degree of truth to it. And I don't agree with it. He's an atheist. But how many of you know, whenever you meet an atheist, you don't ask them, what do you believe? You ask them, what happened? Because most atheists are not people with an intellectual argument. They're someone who's hurt. Because God's put eternity in our hearts. We all know instinctively there's got to be more. But something happened in someone's past that made them angry and then unable to believe. If that happened to me, I can't believe that there is a God or that there's someone good or I don't want to believe. And so whenever I meet someone who says they're an atheist, I always say, what happened? (laughs) Because there's no point dealing with someone's head until you've dealt with their heart. But then once you've dealt with someone's heart, then there'll always be a few head obstacles that you've got to. He said, so I read your stuff and I start laughing and I don't want to laugh because by laughing at what you're saying regarding popular culture, I'm tacitly admitting "Eh, he's got a point. (laughs) Well, we spent about three hours together, talked about faith, talked about the Lord, talked about all sorts. And so one of the joys of my life has been able to talk about popular culture from a Christian point of view in a secular publication. So anyway, um, this book, um, which I would encourage every single one of you to buy 20 copies, so then you can read it 20 times. Um, But my, my prayer for this book is that as you read it, it would encourage you, you're not mad, the world is. And so, so don't lose your confidence. Don't, don't start hiding or shrinking back, but actually be bold and be assertive and don't be embarrassed about the truth because the truth makes sense. Everything else has gone mad. And, and I think we're in a desperate need of just confidence for the church because we're under attack at every point. And I just hope this will just... And the other thing about this book is it will help you to learn how to communicate faith without saying the Bible says. 
because I believe the Bible, but my neighbor doesn't. So when I say the Bible says, my neighbor tunes out. Now, that doesn't mean I don't tell my neighbor what the Bible says. I just don't tell them it's from the Bible. Because wisdom is wisdom and truth is truth. So I don't need to quote the book and verse. I just need to explain truth in a language they can understand. And then they start to say, how are you so smart? And I say, well, I was just born that way. No, I actually go to Encounter Church. We talk about this stuff all the time. Is that what you got? Wow, I, I should. And, and so I think this, this will help you greatly. So it's available in the foyer. And if you don't buy it, you probably won't go to heaven. <laughs> and I'm shocked you would find that funny. But uh, there we go. You ready for the word? Yeah. All right, we've got five minutes left. Heavenly Father. Now, actually, um, I want to I share with you for about 90 minutes. And um, we've got like... What are we calling it? Tastes from around the world or something? Taste of the nations. And I don't know if it's raining or not, but they, they said, look, we can't stop the service until the rain stops. So I'm just going to preach until it stops raining. So um, some of you are praying already, Lord, let the rain stop. We've had enough of him already. I really like this church. It's an easy church to talk in. Very easy. A lot of African people in this church too. <laughs> and they're so reserved. <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got two African boys. Uh, we adopted our kids from Ethiopia when they were six months old. Born to a, a 15-year-old HIV positive homeless girl. Uh, she gave birth to them literally in a shipping container. I said to my now 17-year-old twins recently, I said, are you worried about COVID? They said, Dad, we were born in a shipping container. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And uh, so I, I just, whenever I see Africans, I'm always, because my boys are 17, but I'm always trying to imagine what they're going to look like when they're men. So I always try and find the best looking African man in the congregation and think, Lord, that, oh, just stand up, just stand up. Just come up here, just come up here, just come up here quickly. Just come up, just come up, just quick. Yeah, quick. Could you? Oh, well, I've got twins, so yeah, you come up as well, yeah. <laughs> so I, no, I, can, I can only do two. I, I, I'm just doing this, just stand nice and close. One day, this will be me. Uh, I want to introduce you to my boys. And uh, how many of you know, like, white people have no swag at all. But you guys are like, you just, you just, you just have it. It's just, it's natural. <laughs> Very cool. All right, you can sit down now. <laughs> Bless you guys. All right, we've got 23 minutes. We've got to get into the word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for every person here. Lord, thank you for the church. What an amazing, amazing thing to be part of. Thank you that no matter what our family is like, there's a greater family, the body of Christ, that we can be part of where it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been or what you've done, there's a place for you. I just pray this morning for every person, whether it's our first time in church or whether we've been here many times, whether we're struggling so badly at the moment and feel so out of place right now, or whether we're on top of the world. Lord, everyone is at some point between those extremes in this room right now. And yet every single person greatly loved. Lord, whether we've made so many mistakes, we feel so unworthy, or, or whether we're just battling with things, whatever the case, I pray today that you would help every person to leave just full of confidence that they are not only loved of God, but that you have a great plan and a great purpose. Lord, that no matter what's going on right now, we can approach the future with confidence, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that everything around us was created by God. And the Bible doesn't just tell us that he created everything. The Bible tells us how he did it. The Bible says everything we see was brought into being by the word of God. God said, let there be light, and pfft, there was light. God said, let there be stars in the universe, and pff, there were stars. God said, let there be plants, and pff, there were plants. God said, let there be animals, and pff, there were animals. God said, let there be New Zealand, and everyone said, no. 
he went ahead and did it anyway. But when it came to humanity, to, when it came to creating men and women, when it came to you and I, God didn't speak us into being. No, he varied his creative technique, whereby demonstrating the unique and peculiar relationship God would have with every one of us. God did not speak mankind into being. God created men in a far more intimate way. The Bible says he created out of the dust of the earth a human form, and the first kiss in human history was not on home and away, but rather God himself pressed his own lips, as it were, against those of the dusty outline, and breathing his own breath into it, he created a living soul, people made in the image of God. That's an incredible phrase. It was quoted this morning during the offering that you and I are made in the image of God. What on earth? does that mean? When you understand what it means, I tell you, it changes the way you see yourself. When you understand you're made in the image of God, it changes the way you see your future. When you understand you're made in the image of God, it changes the way you see your next door neighbor. And when you understand you are made in the likeness of God, it changes the way you see what Jesus came to do. You know, there were seven days of creation. And on day six, the angels, I imagine, were, were kind of curious because don't get me wrong, God is always happy, but on day six of creation, he, ha he just had a, 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 a spring in his step. He, he looked like the cat that had swallowed the budgie. He just had this smirk on his face. He just looked pretty happy with himself. And I can imagine one of the angels working up the courage to inquire, you know, God, don't, don't get us wrong. Heaven is always a happy place, but you just look particularly chipper this morning. Is, is there something going on? And I imagine God would have kind of been impressed that they'd noticed and, and would have replied, well, as you know, the last five days I've, I've been busy making things. And the angel said, we know. It's been amazing. Oh, the creation is incredible. And God says, I know it's all good. But today, on day six, I did something very good. And the angel's like, well, what you do? And God said, today I made people. And I imagine all the angels rocking back on their heels saying, whoa, people. And then one of the angels asked what all the others were thinking. What's a people? Because they'd never been a people before. Now, the next part of my sermon is not in the Bible. I'm just going to make it up. It, it's called Preacher's License. And I imagine one of the angels going down to planet Earth and checking out Adam and Eve and watching and observing and, and then getting ready to go back to heaven where the heavenly hosts are waiting with bated breath to find out these people, what are they like? Describe them to us. Have you ever tried to describe something to someone and they've got no idea what you're talking about? So what you do is you look for something comparable or similar with which they are familiar and you use that as something that will help them so they get a, a handle on what it is you're talking about. For instance, if you didn't know what a mandarin was, I'd say, well, are you familiar? with an orange right so you, so now you've got a bit of an idea if you didn't know what a Hyundai was I'd say are you familiar with a rusted twisted piece of rubbish and and you say yeah so well well you you understand a Hyundai and, and so, so so I imagine this angel is there and, and all the heavenly hosts are saying well, well well the people what are they what are they like he said well well, well people they're, they're kind of like well well how can I describe it? he's trying to think of something with which heaven would be familiar that's similar or comparable to you and I and eventually the angel says well, well, well people they're, they're kind of well, well you know God because the truth is there is nothing in the universe more like God himself than you when heaven looks at you the first thing heaven thinks is not oh what a screw up the first thing heaven thinks when heaven looks at you is, man, doesn't she remind you of someone? Man, man, he, he rings a bell. To be made in the image of God is to understand there is nothing and no one in the universe more like, it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, there is nothing and no one in the universe more like God himself than you. That's why the devil hates you. That's why there's a war on humanity right now. Because if you can't kill your ex-girlfriend, you'll get her photo and you'll burn it. <laughs> and the devil can't lay a hand on God, so what's the next best thing? He'll take the image of God and he will destroy that in his rage. And that's why there's a fight for your soul. That's why there's a fight for your family. As we heard this morning, you've got to understand there's nothing in the universe more like God himself than you. And that changes everything certainly changes the way you see yourself because you start to understand you have, if you're made in the image of God, you have intrinsic value. Now, if you don't know what that means, I don't, I don't blame you because we live in a world that measures everything by externals. 
I went to Carey Baptist Grammar School, an exclusive school in Kew, Melbourne. My best friend was John Raftopoulos. He was an only child, but his parents were very wealthy, and they had three motor vehicles, a Golden Rolls Royce, a Porsche 911, and a late model Range Rover. My mum used to pick me up at the school gate in an ex-police Holden Kingswood. <laughs> Easy for you to laugh. I remember being in grade four and asking her if she would pick me up a block away from the school gate. <laughs> and when she said, why? I said, well, you know, mum, childhood obesity is such a big drain on the federal health budget. <laughs> I think I probably just need to walk off the chicken burger I had for lunch at Tuck Shop. And of course, you understand, it had nothing to do with my bulging physique and everything to do with the fact, even in grade four, I understood how the world worked. And I did not want anyone to see my car because if they saw my parents' car, they would ascribe a low value to me because the world measures everything by externals. Some of you young people would be familiar, I guess, at school they have what's called a free dress day. That's such a misnomer because if you wear the wrong clothes on free dress day, it'll ruin your life. But how many of you know, if you're made in the image of God, your value is not determined by your valuables. Your self-worth and your net worth are not the same thing. If I'm made in the likeness of God, my value is not external, it's intrinsic. I remember a friend of mine with a major church in Brisbane doing a seminar for young ladies who'd been badly abused growing up. And there's about 100 ladies present. And in the course of this seminar, they'd sort of developed quite a, a degree of trust. And, and at one point, I'm told, the facilitator got three of the ladies up on stage and gave each a $100 note. And said, I, wa I want you if, you, if you feel okay, just for a few seconds, I want you to imagine that $100 note is you growing up. And I want you to project onto that $100 bill the way you were treated and the way you were dealt with. And uh, I can't really imagine how this happened, but I, I guess there was such confidence and, and camaraderie in the room. They felt comfortable enough to do it. And I'm told the first woman started cursing the most vile thing. The next woman spat on it and started tearing it. The next woman put it on the floor and stomped it. And these women are crying because it's not a $100 bill. This is them. People, I'm told, in, in the crowd started getting teary because it was so... And, and then finally the facilitator said, okay, you can stop. I've got one question, then you can go back to your seats. I remember hearing this thinking, after dragging up all those emotions, <laughs> it want to be a good question. Well, the question was, if you were to take that $100 bill to any store in Brisbane, what would it be worth? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? 100 bucks is 100 bucks. It doesn't matter how much you stomp on it. It doesn't matter how much you screw with it. It doesn't matter how, what you call it. $100 is... A, and the point was well made. It doesn't matter who walks over you. It doesn't matter who screws with you. It doesn't matter what they say about you. Your value is not determined by external things or by other people. If you're made in the image of God... You have intrinsic value and nothing and no one can take that from you. When you understand that, you can walk into any room and feel confident because my value is not determined by my valuables. My net worth is not my self-worth. I'm made in the likeness of God and that gives me confidence. If you understand you're made in the image of God, you can lose everything and yet you've lost nothing. Because the essence of who you are remains unchanged. Scientists did a study of the human body and they found out that if we were to reduce you to your most basic chemical compounds, we would find in you enough iron to make a small nail. In your body, there's enough potassium to shoot a toy cannon. If we were to boil you down, there's enough phosphorus in your body to make 20 match heads. There's enough fat to make seven bars of soap. Some of you could probably go eight or nine. And... <laughs> Time magazine, uh, working out uh, these chemical compounds, on today's market, you and I are worth about $3.50. I remember reading that and thinking, God, you are amazing. Like for 3 bucks 50 God got someone who walks and talks, who dreams and cries, who schemes and lives. Like God is amazing. You and I are worth about the same as a Big Mac and yet capable of so much more. Here's the point. The more ordinary the world tries to make me, the greater the miracle I become. The world will try to shrink you down, but when you know you're made in the image, if you know nothing else of the Bible, just know you're made in the likeness of God. And that changes everything. When you understand you're made in the likeness of God, not only does it change the way you see yourself, it changes the way you see your future because you start to identify with higher things. In 1998, the Copenhagen Zoo announced with great fanfare a brand new exhibit for two weeks and two weeks only, so you better be quick, we're going to have on live display in a glass enclosure in the zoo two live homo sapiens. That's right, a man and a woman, they're going to be in the zoo, you can pay your money at the gate and come and see them. 
You know, I know what you're thinking. Why would anyone pay money to look at people? The, the curator of the zoo said, well, the point is we're going to put them right next to the monkey enclosure to show just how similar humans and chimpanzees are. After all, do you not know humans and chimps share 98.5% of the same chromosomes? That's actually true. I remember reading that. Humans and chimpanzees share 98.5% of the same chromosomes. You know what I thought when I read that? Wow, what a difference the 1.5% makes. <laughs> and so for two weeks... These people were in a glass enclosure, and while the monkeys swung from branches, scratched their armpits, and sniffed each other's bottoms, the man and the woman sent out for takeaway, planned an extension on their home, checked their shares on the stock market, uh, wrote letters to their children, planned an overseas holiday. It was very obvious there was a massive difference between humans and chimps. Towards the end of the experiment, a journalist interviewing the couple asked, so you've only got a few days left in the zoo, will you, uh, will you be, uh, are you going to have sex? The woman sniffed at the reporter and said, of course not. What do you think we are? Well, it's pretty obvious what the curator of the Copenhagen Zoo thinks you are. Scarlett Johansson, the sex symbol who understands so little of what it is she's supposed to symbolize, was asked in 2008 by a Lua magazine, do you believe in monogamy, sexual faithfulness to one person for life? She said, of course not. They said, why don't you believe in monogamy? She said, it's not natural. They said, how do you know it's not natural? She said, well, look at animals. They're not monogamous. I would submit when you're looking to your neighbor's dog for tips on your own sexual etiquette, you've reached a low point in life. Francis Bacon said, we are akin to the beasts in our body, but if we're not akin to God in our spirit, we are wretched and miserable creatures indeed. If I'm made in the image of God, I don't look down for my cues on how to do life. I look up. If I'm made in the image of God, if I'm made in his likeness, I'm not looking at the beasts of the field to work out what I should be like. No, I'm made in the likeness of God, so I look up. If you're made in the image of God, it's not hard to figure out your destiny. Just if I'm made like God, well, just imagine if God were me with my time, my talent, my treasure, what sort of things would God do and just do stuff like that? See, this is how you can work at coal scanning groceries and yet be incredibly significant and powerful. Just if I'm made in the likeness of God and I'm scanning groceries, well, I'll just scan groceries like God would scan them. Which just means the way you would treat customers and the way you'd interact with people and the way you'd interact with management would just be like God. You, you, people say, oh, I'm waiting for my destiny in the sweet by and by. No, no, destiny is not something in the future. It's something you walk in day by day. And, and listen, you don't need some amazing prophetic word. You just need to think, well, if I'm made in the likeness of God, I'll just do things like God would do if, if he were me. And that's how the world has changed. William Wilberforce in the 1800s, uh, he um, was elected to the British Parliament as a young man. And uh, he just lived the party scene, to be honest, um, until one day he was sharing a stagecoach with a guy called John Newton. You might not know the name, but you'll know the song for which John Newton is famous. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now, I went to buy the music uh, some time ago in a music store, and I was shocked to find they'd changed the words. It didn't say that saved a wretch like me. It said that saved a soul like me. They took out the word wretch because that's not very good for your self-esteem. Um, but, but he wrote about himself that he was a wretch, and he was. He was involved in the slave trade. Um, taking people in chains from Africa and, and then selling them like cattle. And one night, in a terrible storm at sea, fearing for his life, he literally tied himself to the mast. He was so afraid of being thrown overboard. And he prayed a prayer. You know those prayers? God, I'll do anything if you just... I, I remember uh, one Christmas Eve. I just started my Christmas shopping. And uh, I was at a major shopping center. And I was starting to panic that I will never have enough time. And, and it's bedlam. Like, there's no parks anywhere. And I, I said, Lord, if you get me a park, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And I'm not joking. Right at that moment, a car pulled out right in front of the store I wanted to get to. So I said, don't worry, I found one. And, and so I pulled in. And uh, so, so John Newton, right, he, uh, he says, Lord, if you say, and, and his life is saved and spared. And, and he, he quits the slave trade sometime later and becomes a Church of England minister. Well, he's sharing a stagecoach with William Wilberforce, and he shares God with Wilberforce. Wilberforce gives his life to Jesus. And he goes home, and he's in his study, and his first ever prayer is, Jesus, forgive my sin. Some of you may pray that at the end of this service, I hope. But then his second prayer is just as powerful. Jesus, forgive my sin. Then his second prayer is, Jesus, what do you want me to do? 
And he felt God speak to him and say, I want you to work for the abolition of slavery. And he devoted the rest of his political career to that one cause. And because of William Wilberforce, the world was radically changed. But, but it wasn't because he had this great revelation. He just said, Lord, if, if you were a parliamentarian, what, what would be the biggest thing right now? And I'll just do stuff in parliament like you would do if you were in parliament. And he changed the world. Destiny is not 10 years in the future. Destiny is this afternoon. Wherever you go, whoever you're with, just do things like God would do if he were you. And you'd be amazed the difference you can make. When you understand you're made in the image and likeness of God, it changes the way you see yourself. Intrinsic value. It changes the way you see your future. You identify with higher things. It changes the way you see your next door neighbor. Because we start to give high value even to the lowest members of society. I remember um, one night, after church, I was talking to this uh, young lady who'd been visiting our church. Her name was Rebecca, and she was back in Australia for a holiday, um, having spent a number of years in Cambodia. And I said, what, what are you doing in Cambodia? She's just this 28-year-old single girl. And she said, well, you know, I was in Australia, and I finished my uni degree, and, and I didn't really have any debt or any responsibility. And I just thought, well, you know, if, if, if I could do anything right now, what, what would I do? And I thought, well, what would God do if he was on earth and just had no responsibility? I'd probably just find the poorest people. I couldn't help them. Wow. So identify with higher things. And so I thought, well, I'll go to Cambodia and, and help people. And so she told me a bit about what she was doing. And, and then she told me, and this amazed me, she said, I'm actually, I'm a foster mum. I said, you're a foster? She said, I've got two kids, two foster kids. I said, can I see a photo? And she shows me a photo of these beautiful Cambodian kids. And she starts getting teary. And I thought, wow, you must really love them. She said, I just hope they live. I said, oh, is your cooking that bad? Um, she said, no, no, it's, it's, they're, they're HIV positive. And I, I said, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. Not only did you foster a couple of kids as just this single young woman, but you fostered two HIV positive kids. Like, wow, what, why would you do that? She said, well, in Cambodia, they've got this idea of reincarnation. Really cool to believe that in Byron Bay where it has no consequences. But in Cambodia, where they really believe it, it has consequences. Reincarnation is the idea that we live many lives and the life you're living now is dependent on how good or bad you were in the previous one. So if you were bad in the previous life, then you'll probably be born rich in this one. But if you were good in the previous life, you'll be born rich in this one. But if you were bad in the previous life, well, then you're probably cursed in this one. And what could be more cursed than being born with HIV? Now, conveniently, in Cambodia, they had some people who were very bad. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge murdered millions of people. And so they just figured, if you were unlucky enough to be born with the HIV virus, you must have been one of Pol Pot's men in a previous life. So we wouldn't cross the road to spit on you, let alone help you. And then, channeling Mother Teresa, Rebecca says to me, but when I look at them, I just see Jesus looking back at me. How could I not foster a couple? I, I just wish I could have fostered more. And I'm thinking, you're amazing. Like, you know, I want to tell everyone in the church, just shut up and listen to her. Get her on stage. Give her a microphone. Give her the keys to the city. Give her a ticket tape parade. Give the girl a medal. She's incredible. And then I thought, what a weird reaction. Why am I getting so excited? Isn't that what normal Christians do? Isn't that what normal Christians, wouldn't it be abnormal not to sponsor someone, it would be normal to sponsor a kid, wouldn't it? Because isn't understanding that people are made in the image of God something that propels you to give the highest value, even especially to the lowest members of... When you understand every person is made in the image of God, it changes the way you see your neighbor who doesn't return your tennis balls. <laughs> it changes the way you see that person at work who, man, they're annoying, but, but, but they're made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, I can't ostracize them like everybody else i can't push them away or demonize them like everybody else i might disagree with them but they're still made in the image and likeness of god so i'm intolerant of keyboard players interrupting my message but i'm tolerant of people because they're made in the oh she's oh no no it's right. sorry wow how did i know i felt an evil presence creeping up behind me you ever wondered why the red cross is called the red cross and not like the red triangle, or the red circle. Well, if it was the red circle, that would be Japan. <laughs> you know, in the late 1800s, a man by the name of Henry de Nantes was walking through what is now modern-day Italy, and there was a massive battle. And thousands of men were dying like dogs from treatable injuries. And as a Christian man, Henry de Nantes could not stomach this. It was wrong. He didn't care which side of the battle they were on. He didn't care about their ethnicity or their, their political ideology. He just cared about the fact these are people made in the image of God and they're dying and they ought not be. And so he 
went to Geneva and campaigned for the establishment of an organization that would render medical assistance to people across the world, no matter their ethnicity, their political persuasion, their sexuality. People are made in the likeness of God, and therefore we've got to love them. And it was called the Red Cross because ultimately it was the cross of Jesus that demonstrated conclusively once and for all the value of every person. Now, if you go to the Middle East, it's not called the Red Cross. They have the Crescent there because they understand better than most Westerners the Christian origins of probably the greatest humanitarian organization on the planet. But if you scratch beneath the surface of pretty much every humanitarian organization, whether it's the trade union movement, whether it's uh, different um, uh, educational or, or medical institutions, if you go back far enough, eventually you find a Christian who just understood, they, they might not have understood a lot, they, they might not have been a brilliant theologian such as Dean O'Keefe from Alpha Crucis, but they, they, might have just, they might have just understood one thing, people are made in the image of God. Well, you and I understand that. So how does that then change the way we see other people? It changes the way you see that person that cuts you off at the roundabout. Last thought, you're doing such a great job. I don't feel hurried or rushed at all. We've got to finish. Are you doing all right? You happy? Listen, if you're made in the image of God, it changes the way you see what Jesus came to do. You know, um, Francis Schaeffer, the great theologian, described humanity as a glorious ruin. That's you, pretty much. You are a glorious ruin. How many of you know we were made in the image of God and then sin ruins and destroys and spoils what was meant to be awesome? All of us could point to areas in our lives and say, man, it was meant to be a lot better than this. And either I screwed it up or things, you know, coalesced or, or whatever. And, and, and every person really is a, a walking glorious ruin. You ever been to Europe and seen the ruins? And, and they're ruins, but, but they're, they're amazing because you can see what they were supposed to be. People are like that. I mean, so many people and they're, they're ruins, but they're glorious ruins. They might hate Christians. They might hate the church and their life is in a mess. But, but if you look with the eye of faith, understand they're made in the image of God. And you can see who they're supposed to, man. And, and so, so you have this heart for people. And this is why Jesus loves humanity. Because the point of Jesus coming to earth was to restore glorious ruins. You know, um, uh, there, there's an author whose name now eludes me, Bill Bryson. Uh, he's a travel writer, but he wrote a book called um, A Short History of Nearly Everything. And he said this, he said, and he's an atheist, right? Um, he said, how could you read a book by an atheist? Well, the same way I eat fish. When I was a little kid, I wasn't allowed to eat fish because mum was worried I'd swallow the bones. But these days I'm an adult, so I, I eat the flesh and I just spit out the bones. So I'm reading this atheist guy and I'm spitting out the rubbish. But some of the stuff he says is quite good because all truth is God's truth. And he says, he says, it's a strange thing that human beings are at once the universe's supreme achievement and its worst nightmare. And I thought, wow, that's true. Isn't human beings are capable of such amazing beauty and of such terrible terrible misdeeds but but let's not put it out there what about ourselves i am the universe's supreme achievement and its worst nightmare because i tell you there are days i am so good you'd think i'm jesus himself i can be kind and gracious and loving and good and yet in the same afternoon i can be vicious and horrible and and all sorts of nasty and it's all from the same person from the same seed came hitler and mother Teresa. how'd that happen because there's this dichotomy through the human heart where we're made in the likeness of God, so there's good, but fallen in sin. So there's this propensity always to go off the rails. And now you understand what Jesus didn't come to make you religious. Jesus came to make you magnificent. Jesus didn't come to put you in a straitjacket. Jesus came to restore the glory with which you were created. And, and, and every single, look, if it's your first time in church, you don't need a preacher to tell you you're wrong. You know in your own heart you're wrong. You don't need a preacher to point out you've made a mess of this and you've screwed up that. And Man, we all know the mistakes we've made and the, the mess we've created. If it's your first time in church, you don't need a preacher to point out all your faults. I'm sure you're well aware of them. And if you're married, your spouse will point them out. What you need is someone to look at you with the eye of faith and say, hey, it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done. God loves you. God's got a great plan. You were created for me. And you know that in your own heart, don't you? Because every January 1st, you determine to be a better person. Why do you do that? Well, because you know you should be. 
And then on January 2nd every year, they decided to put it off for another 12 months. Because you understand, you, you might never have called it sin, but you understand the concept. You understand I'm meant to be more, but somehow I just can't. Sin. The, the Bible says that the power of Jesus is available to every person to break that weight that drags us down and to set us free to be like him and to be who we were meant to be. We're going to pray. And, and I want to pray for every single person who says, James, I, I know I'm not right with God. Would you pray that somehow I would know the love of Jesus and his power in my life? And if that's you, no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, in this moment, God could do something quite powerful in your life. Why don't we all close our eyes for a moment? And so I just, I just want to, it literally help me to know who I'm praying for. So not now, but in a second, I'm going to ask. If that's you, you say, James, I, I'm not asking if you've been to church before. Maybe you have. I'm not asking if you believe in God. You, you probably do. I, I'm asking, has there ever been a moment in time when you stopped and made a deliberate decision to say yes to Jesus? And if you've never said yes to Jesus before, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand up high. I'll see it, acknowledge you. Then you can put it straight down. It just helps me to know who I'm praying for. And then I'm going to pray that, like I said, no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done today, God would touch and help your life. There'll be other people here, and you're already a believer, but for whatever reason, you're away from God. I don't know what's happened, but you know you're not right with God. But today, you can lift your hand as well and say, James, I'm already a Christian, but I need to put my life right. I need to recommit my life to Christ. I'll see your hand, acknowledge you, then you can put it down, and we're going to pray together. So right now, while every eye is closed, if that's you, James, I know I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Would you include me in this prayer? Real quick right now, lift your hand up high so I can see it. And up the back there, 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 down the front here. Right up the back there, good on you. And the gentleman up the back there as well. Two people over on my left, God bless you. Anyone else whose hand I haven't seen yet? Real quick. Is there one more person before we pray? God loves you. He really does. Just say yes to Jesus. As if you'd say no to God. Say yes to Jesus. Last opportunity. Is there anyone else? All right. Let's all stand to our feet together. We're going to pray. So for every one of those people who lifted their hands, I want you to pray out loud after me. We'll all pray together. But, but if you lifted your hand, I want you to pray out loud. The Bible says if you believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? Well, if Jesus is God, guess who's not? If Jesus is God, you're not. Hashtag awkward. Because I kind of like being the center of the universe, and that's always been my problem. To become a Christian isn't to become religious. It's simply to admit, I'm not the center of the universe. You are. Sorry for acting like I was. I'm going to stop doing that. I don't know if I can stop doing that. I'm going to need your help to stop doing it. Would you help me every day not to be in control, but rather to trust you? That's what becoming a Christian is. That's why I come to church. Because every day it reminds me, you know, it's not about me. It's about the Lord. And I get a company of believers who just encourage me. Come on, there's someone bigger than you. Let's pray together out loud, every person after me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving me. I know you love me. You proved it when you died on the cross for my sin forgive me from this day on I commit myself to following you help me I pray amen father for every other person here I thank you that we are made in the image and likeness of God Lord I thank you that means we're not just taking up the, the space we're not just making up numbers but we are on planet earth for a purpose to represent you I pray this week as we go into our places of study our places of work our community organizations Lord I pray that you would help us to represent you well that you would help us to be salt and light that you would help us to demonstrate your love your care your compassion Father I pray that people would experience the love of Jesus through us as we represent you and together we would make a difference for story your glory to people's lives in Jesus name we give you all the praise and all the glory and everybody said amen amen, amen. 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 Thank, thank you so much Pastor James can we please give a massive hand to Pastor James McPherson thank you so much for that word oh my goodness so good do you feel encouraged but do you feel challenged yes how good that is incredible I think my favorite thought in there I'm just gonna go back I think I need to write it maybe on my office window because that's where I like to write things. Please go back. I love this thought. Is destiny isn't 10 years from now. It's what you do this afternoon. Hey, that is such a good thought. And then just do things that God would do if he was you. I Thank you, Pastor James. 
for everything that you're bringing. I just, and not just today, but just in everything that you're doing. <laughs> I just really appreciate it. And I highly respect you for man of God. So thank you. And Dean, it's also great to have you here. Dean is on staff at Alpha Cruces in Adelaide as an absolute legend, like Pastor James said, is um, Mr. Theology. Uh, so it's great to have you here. I hope you found James's message good. <laughs> Uh, why don't you take our seats really quickly? And um, if you did just raise your hand, please know someone will come with a Bible and put that in your hand because we want to help you with that decision. But before we go and eat some stuff that's probably wafting through just a little bit is we want to take an opportunity to actually bless and thank Pastor James for his ministry this morning. This is something that we do as Encounter every time we have a guest speaker or guest worship leader because we just want to honor them and be generous and say, hey, thank you so much for your investment. And like I said, around a time of giving is we're created. Hey, my brother's calling. How are you going? No, um, is, um, we were created in the image of God, just like Pastor James said. And what a great question. If God was sitting in your seat right now, and there was an opportunity to bless Pastor James with the word that he's giving, what would he do? What would he do? And so why don't you think about your budgets? Why don't you think about what you've got available? And I want you to consciously make a decision. Hey, I'm going to sow into this person again. Can I point out that this is a rare voice that has biblical and culture and literally speaks right into the middle of that. And so I'm just going to give you a moment to prepare and have a think about that so that we can bless and uh, be generous towards Pastor James and all that he is doing. What do you think my brother's calling him out? Should I tell him? I'm in church. Might just text him a photo of you all. Say, just here. Just uh, hanging out. He'll be like, what are you doing? As you prepare, you're giving again. There's credit card slips on every second seat. You give by direct deposit and say, Pastor James, or by text message, and uh, all of will take up an offering in a minute. But why don't you hold something in faith if you're giving this morning? Holy Spirit, I thank you for an incredible word. God, I thank you so much for the privilege of having Pastor James here with us this morning. God, to be um, have something invested, Father God, that literally expands us and challenges us and grows up and grows us, God. And I just pray a huge blessing over Pastor James and his family, especially his two growing men. Lord God, we just declare, Father God, that they would continue in, their, in your way, Father God, and that they'd also be great light in the midst of darkness. God, we thank you for every place um, that you're taking, James, every conversation that he's in the middle of and that he's going to have in the next few weeks. God, bless him abundantly. And I pray, God, a special anointing and wisdom as he writes. God, I thank you for the humor and the open doors that that is creating. God, we bless you for his ministry. And God, we just pray for everything that we give this morning, that God, it would reflect... God, our heart for you and our likeness of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, thank you so much for your generosity towards Pastor James, towards the church, but for towards people. We absolutely love you. And we're going to receive that offering right now. And let's text my brother and just go, in church. Oh, I said in church, on state. I'll just say on stage. As I said, Taste of the Nations is actually going to start 10 minutes after the service. So you have time to grab a coffee, even check out Pastor James's book, Notes from Woketopia. Uh, and you can purchase that today. If we sell out, you can grab it online also. Um, but it's going to start 10 minutes. So don't rush outside for the food because they're just going to get all of the slow cookers and get them and all set them up ready. Um, but as you know, is every plate is $3. And so you need to buy, instead of going to every spot and going $3, $3, $3, that's going to take forever. So the way that we're doing it is you buy tokens and those tokens are worth $3. And so you go to a pay station. There's one in the foyer just under the Encounter Church sign and there'll be two outside. You go there and if you're Pastor Paul and Lorraine, I'm sure you want to try everything. So you say, can I buy 30 tokens? And they'll say, sure thing. And then they'll say, that's how much is that? $90. I was about to say that and I thought, whoops, if it's not. Anyway, sound like an idiot. Anyway, so <laughs> it's $90. But that's what you do. So you buy a amount of tokens that you're looking to get. So there is... Um, African rice, there is ravioli from Italy, there is pork, pork buns, there's fairy floss, there's donuts, there's like so many good things. I think there's menus around, there's what? Nachos, noodles, there's, oh my gosh, Wendy's been cooking like some cool like lemongrass kebabs from Cambodia. There's just like so many excellent things. So you go to the pay stations, you, got, you buy some of those tokens and then you take those tokens to the stands. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I'm so glad. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. You made a great decision to come. And hey, I encourage you, go back and listen to Pastor James's message on one of your commutes this week because it was absolutely excellent. Again, thank you both for coming. Church, stand your feet. We're going to go out. Oh, yes. And no night service because this is a combined 10 a.m. Before we go, BJ. 
You did a great job with the graphics on that song. Can we just roll that behind whatever song we sing right now? Because I thought it was so cool. I think you're excellent. Excellent. Let's go. (laughs) 